Hey everyone, here we go with our third Bible study, and I thought like all good TV programs, we should have a guest, and today it's Bella. Bella is my little princess. She is my bulldog, one of two, and she decided she wanted to show up today. So before we get into our final section on the wedding of Cana in our section, I thought I would introduce you to her. Hopefully she brings you some joy in your quarantine. All right. And no, she didn't enjoy that. So, we're going to get to the wedding of Cana. What a wonderful section. Now, I must preface this with the fact that this is the one section of John I actually wrote a paper on. And it was because I was very passionate about some of the stuff I think I saw through it. Um, and I invite you to please, uh, uh, if you see some other stuff, engage with it. But this is what I saw. Uh, some of this stuff obviously was not my initial uh, observation. I was working with a dear friend who's passed and been with the Lord now named Chris Davidson. And he has, um, and he and I came up with some observations of what we thought John was doing. So starting with chapter 2, verses 1, it, we find out that, and I invite you to do this yourself, but you'll find out that there's a bunch of days coming on in chapter one. He he calls his first disciples on that day. Behold the Lamb of God on that day. By the time we get to the wedding of Cana, he says on the third day. If you add it all up, it's either six or seven. There's some debate on this. I'm not going to get into that. My professor thinks it's seven. I'm not so sure. It depends if you count the day that they don't say it's a day, the day before S7 anyways, it doesn't matter. That's a bunch of theologians arguing over stuff. But here we are at the wedding of Canaan. Why it's important that we see these number of days is we, of course, go back to the uh, creation story. On the seventh day, God created, or God rested after he's done this great creation. And, of course, all of this is about the new creation in Jesus Christ. All right? So, there we go. So here we go at the wedding of Cana. Now, you cannot help but see the whole picture of creation through this. And what he's going to do now is how he is, what John's going to demonstrate is how Jesus Christ is going to recreate, how he's going to change the problem from creation. So it says, on the third day, there was a wedding of Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. This is all going to be very important to John's description, how he's going to lay this out. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. All right. Now, a wedding in the ancient world isn't like a wedding today. You don't go off. You don't do a wedding at one. Uh, go have wedding pictures. Then you go have the reception, maybe. And that's it. In the ancient world, the wedding was a, a, represented the covenant between God and his people. It was very much as much worship as it was reverence. If you did not put on a good show, it would last seven to ten days. If you didn't put on a good show, you could be sued. You could be sued, literally, for not having enough stuff. Remember that as we're going through this. And there's much testimony about this. All right? So, Jesus was also invited to the wedding with his disciple. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said, they have no wine. Now, what's very important is to listen to Jesus' words here. All right? Now, this is not a minor thing. It, up comes your mother in this family wedding, relatives, and they are in desperate need. They have nothing left to hold on to. I look like I'm glowing today. Well, there you go. I'm very holy. Anyways, it was a joke. They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, now look at the next word if you have your Bible with you. Woman. This word in, in the Greek is gune. Okay? It would be like if my mother came up to me, only ten times worse, and said, Emery, uh, do you have some... Toilet paper. <laughs> and I said, woman, she'd be offended, 
rightfully so. If you were in the room, you'd be offended that I would say that to my mother. In that world, 10 times worse. So John puts it in there to shock you. It's the shock value. That's going to be important for us, the reader, who are taking special sensitivity to what's going on. All right? So he says, woman, what does this have to do with me? Well, she's obviously asking a question on one level. He's answering it as is so typical in John on a different level. My hour has not yet come. Well, there's our first clue to what the wedding of Cain is about. So far, we've seen the picture of Jesus Christ, the creator, John 1 to 18. John 19 to the end of the chapter is all about how something is going to change between Torah and what Jesus is doing. He ends up with this question about what the wine is going to do for him. We're on day seven or six of this creation story. We're expecting something different. He says, my hour has not yet come. What is the hour? Well, we know in John's gospel, we, the reader, have acknowledgement that other people will not have. That the hour always is that moment of his crucifixion. That's his hour of glorification. That's his moment. So let's keep that in mind, that he somehow sees the wine in this picture as a symbol of what's going to happen on the hour, his hour. He's saying, what does this have to do with me? This isn't my time. He's trying to make a point here. And we, as the listener, want to make that connection. And by the end, you will really, really understand this. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells me, tells you. You've got this classic, um, you have this classic, uh, um, Picture in John's gospel where you have this fellowship of people who are being discipled. And the key is to follow Jesus. Okay, so that's that's hugely important that Mary points away from herself and tells her what to do. Now, there were six stone j water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification. What that was... And it was hugely important is if you had come across something that made you impure. It's hard for us to understand the emphasis in our culture anyways of impurity. Maybe more now we have a virus going around. But the Jews thought that if you were impure, you could not come before the face of God. That meant a whole pile of things. It didn't just mean some overt sin. It meant if you accidentally ran across a dead carcass and by accidentally touched a person who'd been by a dead carcass, you would have to come in, and in a worship ceremony, you would come in and be cleansed, and they had prepared this for you, so you could come into this worship service, which is a wedding, which is a covenant. Notice that, because Jesus again and again, sorry, God again and again, is going to connect the relationship between humanity and God in a marriage covenant ceremony. You're my bride. How can a man forsake his bride? You'll see that again and again. Look in Isaiah. Now, there were six stone purification jars. Numbers matter in John. They don't matter like you think in, uh, say, uh, we do a biography where somebody's there and go, one, two, three, four, five, six. Six for him is the um, number for humanity. The number of, of not perfection. Seven is perfection. So there is a point being made here that this Jewish law, which is providing this purification on the outside, is being a concept where you're going to be cleansed, but that's it. All right? And he puts six in again. Don't get caught up in numbers in John. They didn't write, write biographies in that genre like we do. They're not as concerned with chronology or numbers as much as if, if it works better to make a theological point, and all their readers expected this, by the way, so they weren't upset. Then they would sit there and they would listen. And the six in this case, of course, puts us back into the number which it would have meant to them 
which was the human ability to purify himself. Now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each totally holding 20 to, or 30 gallons. There's been a lot of debate with the 20 or 30 gallons. I'm not gonna put that in down. You know what, when I've always said this, the more ink that's spilled on something, the more we don't know. I've come to the conclusion we don't know. There's a reason it's there. And I, you know, you can look yourself if you want. And they filled them to the brim. So what, this is the fullness of the Jewish system of cleansing yourself. This is all about how you, through the law, through, through religion, can cleanse yourself. This is it. We're full right up. And he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. Oh, am I, did I miss something? No. And he said to them, now draw some out and bring it to the master of the feast. So they did. When the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine. Immediately we see this transformation that's going to be so important when we get to the hour of Jesus. The wine, of course, we know, if you've been to church once, that Jesus Christ connects his blood with wine, right? We get that all right away. So everyone in the first century understood. We see that the pagans who criticized Christianity understood this. This is about the purification of of Jesus and what does the wine mean of course it means his sacrifice so when the master of the feast tasted the water become wine and did not know where it came from remember earlier in John they did not know him when he came it's hugely important they the religious leaders don't know the living God a huge hint for us religious leaders that we should always be humble I know there was a gentleman that uh, got a uh, uh, Facebook text about that gentleman who kept his church going <clears throat> because, well, if the grocery stores are open, then the church should be open. And you probably heard about this too, the 1,000. That's just arrogance. It's just stupidity. It's not love. And uh, I'll, we'll pray for him. When the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, and did not know where it came from, Though the servants who had drawn the water out knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom. Again, go to your Old Testament. All covenant between humanity and God through Israel and God is one of a bridegroom and his bride. That's the metaphor. So the fact he's going to a bridegroom in a covenant ceremony, we're, we're joined to God by a covenant. All of this, you can, it just echoes to a Jewish ear calls the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have got drunk freely, then the poor wine. By the way, I just think that's a very uh, honest observation. <laughs> uh, I'm not from the first century, but he's basically saying, you wait till somebody gets liquored up and then you get out the cheap beer, the lucky lager, as it were. Um, obviously, uh, you know, as much as alcoholism is a issue that we need to take seriously, it wasn't, that's not the point here. The point is that people got liquored up back then. Jesus is part of a party. It's what happened. All right, sorry if that offends. Everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely of the porn wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. What are we seeing here? We see the picture of the two covenants. You've got, and you're going to see this again and again with Jesus, you can't stick new wine and old wineskins. Whatever Jesus is doing is not going to fit within the structure of Judaism, first century, second temple Judaism, as it were. He, because we know he's God, they didn't, is going to transform absolutely what this is about. He's going to transform what it means to be purified. He's going to transform what it means to be in relationship with him. He's going to transform what it means to be covenant. That's what this is all about. The creator manifest is going to change the system so that religion is no longer what it's about, but relationship. All right. But you have then the poor wine, but you have kept the good wine until now. This is all a metaphor, of course, of the different covenants. This, the first of his signs, we're going to find out in John's
gospel, there are, how many would you guess, with a creation story? Seven signs. All right. Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory. What's his glory? His glory is in the cross. That's where his glory is. So he manifests his glory in this action. Now, bear with me because we're going to get to that. And his disciples believed in him. Well, yes, they believed in his power. They may have believed in him to be the messianic figure, but we're, we're going to start seeing in John's gospel is that belief is muted by their expectation. Remember this, that belief can be muted by expectation. You can believe in God and think that he is the Easter bunny. <laughs> you can believe in God and think that he is going to wipe out all your enemies. What Jesus shows is that his revelation is not what they expect, but they believe in him on this level. And this he went to, and after this he went down to Capernaum with his mother and his brothers and his disciples to stay there for a few days. So now he's gone. He's done this. He's shown this miracle. We're at the end of this section. So what does this section mean? What does John want us to get out of this water to wine? Because he actually has put in a few references for us. And to do that, we have to go back to the shocking word he called his mother, which was woman. So now, if you happen to have a Bible, if not, don't worry, I will find it for you. We go to chapter 19 of John, all right? And I'm going to have to find this out myself. And they go to the crucifixion. And we have Jesus there. Let me find this. All right, chapter tw verse 26. When Jesus saw his mother and his disciple whom he loved, which clearly is John, um, yes, uh, there's been some uh, argumentation that John was a little bit full of himself. Um, you know, Emery, the disciple Jesus loved. Um, I think it was more of a recollection of Jesus' love towards rather than his deserving of love. All right, so that's how John's gospel writ was written. Mary the wife, okay, so he said, Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loves nearby, and he said to his mother, and this is the only other time he says this to the wedding of Cana, Gune, woman. Uh, do you see the connection? There's a definite point for Paul. He wants to take you from the wedding of Cana to the crucifixion, okay? And he does that by using this reference that would shock. It's a beautiful literary move. Now, some people will say, did he really say it that way? You're missing the point of how they wrote Greek bios. That's not the point. The point is, Jesus is crucified. That's historical. He's resurrected. That's historical for John. The point of this is to theologically draw this out into what the meaning of that is, which is far more important to him than the exact wording or who's there. Okay? So he says, Gune, behold your son. So he's changing the relationship, and we're seeing a different moment now remember that in the gar at the wedding of cana he is the son so he is now passing this over whatever is going on is going to be passed on through this person then he said to him behold your mother and now we have this new relationship and from that hour you notice that remember my hour has not come the disciple took her to home so we see this new relationship happening through the crucifixion after this jesus knowing that all was now finished, said the scripture, I thirst. And we find this jar full of sour wine given to him. So they put a, a sponge near the of a hyssop branch and held to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, go back to the other gospels. He doesn't receive the wine. What's going on here? He's taking in the old into himself. All right. It is finished, he bows his head, and then his side is pierced. So we already know for sure the winning of Cana is connected with the gospel and the crucifixion. Jesus' side is pierced. Since it was the day of preparation, and so that the bodies might remain on the cross, the Jews asked Pilate that his legs might be broken. Uh, but when they came to Jesus, they saw he was already dead. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out, only in this gospel it says, blood and water, purification and wine. What comes out of his side in John's gospel 
is the truth that the purification that comes on the outside in the Old Testament system, the wine that was no longer useful, the wine that wasn't the best wine has been taken over, and he, out of his sacrifice now, purifies humanity. Out of his side comes the water of purification and his blood, which is the symbol, going back to the, to the wedding of Cana, of the water and wine transformation, that he has turned the world upside down. The Jews came to their covenant ceremony. They wanted to have an experience with God. They cleansed the outside of themselves so they would become pure. That's culturally very important. Jesus comes to that ceremony and says, this isn't the end. And in himself, he looks at his mother and tells her, hey, this isn't the time, but I, in this sign, he points to what it means. He's going to take that system and he's going to turn it on its head. Through his sacrifice, he's going to purify through the inside and he's going to change relationships. He's going to change the whole dynamic. Now, your mother, <laughs> that was so important in the ancient world, He's going to pass that on, and we have a new family of God. This is what this picture is about. It's an incredible, incredible picture. And this is the seventh day, if my professor's right, of this picture of John, of what this means. The six days are done. They're all good. The Jewish system's good, but God is going to do something better. He's going to do something we couldn't do. He, through Jesus Christ, through his sacrifice, is going to purify us through his sacrifice, through his blood, and he's going to purify us through the water of purification that falls upon him. It's one of the most beautiful pictures. Now, if we go to John's epistle, which there's some debate of whether John wrote this or not, which I think is irrelevant. Somebody knew John really well wrote it, or it was John. So here we go. I'm trying to find this. Okay, here it is. And the blood of Christ purifies, the only other time it says this, of our sin. There it is. So John's epistle points out what this is all saying, that it's through Jesus Christ's blood that the water, which is symbolized through the Jewish purification rites, purifies us on the inside. It purifies us and changes us on the inside. And the blood of Christ purifies us. So when you go to the wedding of Cana, you see Jesus coming in. It's an old system. There's a covenant going on, which represents always in the Jewish system was a worship ceremony representing God and Israel. And it was just a reflection. By the way, this is why we have marriage so messed up in our cultures. We don't understand. Well, sorry, not that we have it in our culture, but as Christians, we don't understand that marriage for us is an echo or a reflection of our relationship with God. It is a covenant ceremony before God of our relationship. Because we don't understand that, there's all kinds of debate about what this means and what that means, and we don't know how to interpret it because we've romanticized it. First of all, Jews understood that that covenant, and by the way, Jews weren't worried about romantic love or how they felt. They were barely surviving. So... That was the world they lived in. I mean, I'm not saying, I'm not making a political point there. There's just a reality that romanticism was a 19th century phenomenon. Here they come in to a wedding ceremony. We see a covenant, which is all about a worship of a God in Israel. Jesus comes in and the purification jars are there, representing how they became pure before God. And it was an ongoing event. We have the water and the wine. We have Jesus coming in saying, my hour has not come. Well, we see that the hour is at, at the crucifixion. We see him saying, woman. There's that connection at the crucifixion. And another time he calls his mother woman. And by the way, it was terribly offensive for a Jew to call his mother woman. Like this is not our culture where we are disrespectful to parents all of the time. Clearly he's trying to make a point about the covenant between God and humanity we have the six purification jars. He turns the water into wine. We have this moment where we see that this wine is the most beautiful wine you can have, the sacrifice. At the crucifixion, again, he calls her woman. 
You have this relationship change, whereas John is now given over and this new family. And out of Jesus' side, at that hour, another where it says it echoes the wedding, they pierce his side and only in that gospel you see water and wine come forth. The purification now comes out of the sacrifice so that when we take the elements in communion, what we're taking literally is that purification into ourselves. We take his symbolically, of course. It doesn't turn in magically into the blood of Jesus. I'm sorry to my friends who are into that. I think you're wrong. But don't underestimate the symbolism and what the Spirit's doing there. We are taking within ourselves that new covenant that God has built, that new marriage ceremony that he took on the cross. And out of him, so when we are in him, out of him flows the purification, the water and the wine. And as John's epistle says, the blood of Christ covers, purifies. The word is purifies, very important, all of our sin. I hope that helps. It's a, a wonderful picture. It's one of those ones where you can read it. And on one level, you go, okay, I get that. You can, I can tell Haley about the, the water to wine. And she goes, wow, that's a miracle. She sees it as Hogwarts and, and, and all that stuff that she loves. And, and Jesus just becomes the grand um, <laughs> magician in some cases. But when you theologically take it in John's gospel, you end up with this incredible picture of how God deals with us. How important is that today? How important is it today to know when you're living full of fear? And hey, we all are. We're all anxious. Come on. And you're down and you're recognizing, you know, you, you just stare across at people who, uh, who might sneeze and you're freaking out. That this is the covenant that Jesus has made for us, that he has purified us through his blood that he has changed relationships now so that that my mother, as much as I love her, is now part of a bigger family and that there are others that are connected with her in a way in Jesus' world, he changes all of that. That's what the winning in Cana is. It's an incredible experience of how Jesus takes religion and doesn't disband it, but purifies it through his blood. All right. Any questions? I'm looking on the side. I do have the side. I realize that now. And if there's any questions, now is the time. Hi, Trevor. I just saw your hey, Em. Long time no see, my friend. I'd say I'd come see you and my friend Christine and, and, and Trent, but unfortunately, I'm not allowed out. All right, well, I'm not getting any questions at this time. You can uh, review this. You can disagree with me. You can ask me questions. Please feel free. Um, I look forward to doing, yeah, I miss you too, buddy. Uh, looking forward to doing on, on Sunday, or sorry, Monday, my next one, which, by the way, we shouldn't be surprised that right after we have the wedding of Cana, because he's overturned the system, that was the, the purification of the, the Jewish system. He's now going to go to the temple. That's how John's gospel is going to write this. It's not that there's two cleansings of temples. He's just theologically writing. And the temple is to purify. Jesus is doing something new, folks. And it isn't the system that was driven by the Levitican law. So there's a tip for you. Read the cleansing of the temple. I will do it for you on Monday. Well, bless you all. And I hope you guys keep safe. Keep washing those hands. Stay away from those stores and uh, bless you.